Hey, this morning, um, I want to, just before I pray, I want to acknowledge something. As I uh, lean into this message this morning, I'm excited to, to bring this, but I was aware as I was sitting there and worshiping God that this message for me this morning was really birthed here at South Point Church. And uh, I want to just say, I want to say thank you to everybody who was here when I was here back in two, from 2009 to 2014 who loved our family. I just want to thank you this morning. I just, um, as we're going to talk today about loving God and loving your neighbor, um, I believe that South Point Church really taught me what that looked like. And so I want to thank you this morning. Um, if you could do something for me as uh, we begin this message, I'm going to ask everybody to just get into a spirit of just receiving from God. And what we're going to do as we begin to pray, I'm going to ask everybody to just hold their hands out like this. And we'll close our eyes and just ask that God would drop so deeply into our our mind, our psyche, our thought life, the God of the universe who created heaven and earth and did it with the snap of a finger by wisdom, who also created us beautifully and wonderfully made, we receive from you this morning, God. May you pour in our lap, in our life, Lord, all that you have for us, Lord. And would you reveal to us this morning your desire, your priority for our lives, Lord. I want to acknowledge, Lord, before we move forward, Lord, that we are honored and thankful, Lord, that, that you would visit us today. That you're not just high, lifted up, and you looking down on your people, but you actually are amongst us today, that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And so as we stand here with our hands open wide to you, many of us broken, many of us in pain, many of us undone, many of us trying to figure this thing out, we thank you, Lord, that you love us perfectly just the way we are. And so would you, by way of your grace, Move in our life today. And we came in one way, Lord. I thank you that today we will leave another way. Better because we understand your love and your priority for our lives. May you bless today. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Hey, um, I, um, I was here on staff for, I actually did two terms here. I was on staff for five and a half years um, from 2009 to um, uh, 2014. And one of the things that happened by being here, Pastor Matt really taught me something about engaging my neighbor. He taught me something about engaging my neighbor. And so when we left here uh, to plant a church, uh, we went into a very diverse community. In my community, uh, there are all types of races, all types of uh, of people group. There's all types of religious uh, affiliations. Uh, in fact, in our area, 60% uh, of our community are fully unchurched, will not have anything to do with church. And so we went there with the idea of how can we go into a community and embrace our neighbors in a way that would be so effective by way of love that they would be compelled to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Sounds like a good plan, right? And so uh, we, we go there, and I, I right away meet this guy. His name is Bob, okay? And so Bob, uh, I used to call him Bob, affectionately known as Bob the Budweiser guy, because he, every day I would see him with this case of Bud, and he'd be walking, and he'd kind of like, you know, he's got a really weird walk, but I'm not going to make fun of him, but uh, I, well, I do make fun of him I may, in, in his face, so... We joke. But Bob is an interesting guy. Bob has uh, several kids. And so uh, when we brought our little boys into this neighborhood, uh, Bob's kids would play with my kids. Now, Bob is a self-proclaimed uh, southern good old boy. That's how he describes himself. And he has some other adjectives that uh, describes him, his own self that I won't mention here today. 
Uh, but Bob, just really contagious kind of guy. He's the kind of guy that tell you the way it is and tell you what's on his mind and tell you what he's thinking. And, and, and I love that about him because Bob is just real. And, and one day, um, Bob <laughs> kind of got too real. I mean, you, you know, we, we started talking, and he had been drinking, and, and something must have happened at work or something, and Bob just started into his, you know, his antics where, you know, Bob is very paranoid. He, he, he's got this mindset that everybody's trying to get something from you, and you can't trust the government, and you can't do this, and he's very guarded, just guarded. And so, so and, and then Bob one day just kind of blurts how you, and, and, and you people, da, 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 he just went past, you know, just started, he just, the you people thing just kind of came out. And I was like, well, hold on, Bob, what do you mean, man? And so he, so he tried to pull it back, but I think the alcohol was kicked in a little bit too far, and so Bob just started letting stuff go, and it was flying all over the place. And the beauty of, of, of it is is that um, I'm already conditioned to believe that you engage a community on their terms. And so Bob, for years, I, I well, about he he. He found out quickly that I was a pastor, so he would cut his cussing back from 100% to maybe 75%. <laughs> and so, 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 but Bob this day just, he just started talking and he let one fly. He let one fly, you know, the one, he just let it fly. And then, and then it, he let it fly and he, I think if he had hands to catch it, he would have just went and caught it, ah, but he couldn't, it was too late, it was already out there. And at the time, I had to decide, what am I going to do about Bob? Because Bob is my neighbor, and the Bible says, love your neighbor. And now my neighbor seems like he's not even my neighbor anymore because he's got a little something in him, and he's just saying stuff that just, if I could be honest, it, it hurts some. Bob, your kids come to my house. My kids come to your house. You know, what's going on here? Uh, I was about 20-something years old, tw uh, 23. Uh, I had given my life to the Lord. Now, just, just so you know, it was pretty much a miraculous thing because one thing about me uh, that's probably similar to most people is that I'm about me. <laughs> I'm all about me. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I love my comfort. I love my money. I love my car. You know, all the stuff I love, it's all about me. And all of a sudden, Jesus starts tapping on the door of my heart. Oh, I didn't mention that um, there's some things about my life that I was kind of a, well, not kind of, but I'm ashamed of, that I, I don't want anybody to know. And some of those things I want to hold on to. Anybody in here? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and there's some broken areas of my life, but, I'm, but, but I got I to gotta shine like nothing is really going on and nothing is hurting. And I know that I'm in desperate need of a God who just loves me exactly the way I am. And so that happens. And one of the things that I figured out really quick, that if God loves me the way I am, then I have somewhat of a responsibility to love him back. Um, in fact, I believe, as we were singing songs this morning that reflected the cross and, and, and giving God glory, that it, it's, it's apparent to me that God made us, you and me, his priority. That we are God's priority. And in return, somehow I figured out in my life that if God is made me his priority that maybe I should put him as priority. And so I received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and the Savior part was easy because the Savior part is what God does. Nothing I could do about the Savior part but say, yay, hey, God, I'm, I'm ready to be a part of yours. And he says, oh, you saved, come on in. The Lord part, though, does require something of me, uh, which, call, which some would call surrender, to his lordship. Uh, it requires some submission to what he desires. Uh, it requires me to prioritize him. 
And so I'm probably like many of you in this room, that when it comes down to priority, we all have our priorities, right? We all have what's important to us, our core values, what's significant. And so the question is, is God the top of my priority or are there other things? Like my ethnicity, my race, my background, my upbringing, my comfort, my money, my job, my education, my boo. <laughs> my, uh, my girlfriend, I'm sorry, my girlfriend. It was before I was married, y'all. <laughs> so she said, get it straight. <laughs> and so I figured out real soon that if, if I'm going to do this, somehow I, I got to align what the priority is in my life. Is my priority even my family or is it Jesus? And I'll never forget, I was sitting in bed one night, and this is going to sound crazy as I'm just getting y'all prepared for it. As I was sitting in bed and I started praising God, I said, God, I love you. I give you praise. And this is like, I'm talking about within the first year of my Christian walk. I said, God, I love you. And God speaks to my heart so deep and so desperately and so profoundly. He says, I love you. Now, if you're like me, you're wondering and you're asking the question, how could God really love me? Anybody in this room? Or is it just me? I mean, for me, I'm like, God, how could you love me? You know everything about me. And it's nothing lovable about me. I'm faking all the time to get approval. God, you know that. And I'm actually trying to get your approval right now. And God says, no, need no approval. I love you just the way you are. And something happened on the inside that said, well, God, if you love me, you're probably requiring me as a priority to love others. Okay, God, hold on now. Love others. Love those who use you. Yes. Love those who abuse you. Yes, from afar. Love those who take advantage of you. Yes. Love those who, who really hurt you. Yes. Love those who don't look like you. Yes. Love those who are of a different race than you. Yes. Love those who are, are unlovable. Yes. And so something caught on at that point. And I, and I often wondered, as Jesus was walking through the land, doing good, healing all, Casting out demons. I wonder if the people who were just like me, who had this religious mindset that you had to be a certain way in order for God to love you. Uh, and I'm talking about the Pharisees. I'm talking about the, 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 the law, the, the readers of the law, the experts in the law. I wonder what they thought about when they saw Jesus hanging out with a woman who had five husbands and the one that she was living with now is not the husband and loving her. I wonder what the, 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 the leaders of the law, the experts of the law, thought about the woman who was thrown out in front of him and said, what should we do with this woman? She's been caught in adultery and Jesus pardons her, forgives her, says, go and do it no more because he had love and compassion for her. I, I wonder, these leaders of the law, these religious uh, law experts, what they thought when they saw Jesus hanging out with deplorables, people who weren't like him and loving them. I wonder what the, the rulers, the, the leaders the experts of the law thought when they saw this sinful woman washing Jesus' feet with her hair, and, Jesus, and people, they're looking and said, doesn't, 
don't Jesus know who this woman is? She's nasty. She's foul. And Jesus loves her just the way she is. And one of those experts of the law confronted Jesus with a question that I think everyone in this room has. God, how can I make it to heaven? What's appropriate? Because you seem to love so many people and accept so many things. I understand the law. I understand the Ten Commandments. I understand the 600 laws that are out there. And you seem to break some of them. Uh, let's talk about the Sabbath. You break the Sabbath. You healed on the Sabbath day. Jesus, what is this really all about? How can I make it or how should we make it to heaven? And what's the greatest command? And Jesus says this. We'll look at it right here. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your what? He says, love me, love God with everything that's in you. All that you have, love him. And then he doesn't stop with that. Then he says, and you read this, and what? Okay, hold on. Hey, let me just qualify a couple of things. By the way, y'all can, everybody can just loosen, everybody just do like this real quick. Just, no, 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 this is, this is, yeah. Crack, crack, I heard some necks cracking out there. <laughs> the church, the little church, I, uh, these people, they talk to me through the whole entire service, man. I'm like, they just saying stuff. No, it says, I got one guy, I got one guy that sits on the front row. And I, he might watch this later, so, I'm, so he knows I'm talking about him. If I say something that's good, he'll say, damn. He don't even say amen. He says, damn in church. <laughs> really? I got the craziest people in the world. So short of damn, if you want to say something, you can just, amen, go ahead, brother, say that or whatever. Whatever the case might be. And love your neighbor as your what? Here's one thing that I've thought about over the last couple weeks. This hit me like a bomb two weeks ago. Part of the reason why we have a hard time loving our neighbor is because we sometimes don't love our... We, we, we love the facade of ourselves. But probably everyone in here has looked in the mirror at one point in time and said, what the heck is going on? <laughs> What's wrong with me? Is it just me? If I could be honest, sometimes I don't love myself. And it's almost virtually impossible to love somebody else perfectly if you don't love yourself perfectly. And part of the reason why we don't love ourselves correctly is because we don't understand how desperately, awesomely, perfectly we're loved by Jesus. Yeah. And I know, look, for some of us, that's hard. I am going to tell you that for me personally, it was a hard, it was hard for me to grasp that concept, that idea. I learned of God's love when I came to St. Mary's County. I struggled through, I know that God loves you, brother. He's got to love you because you're cool. He loves you, sister. You're a wonderful sister. I, I have decided you even got the t-shirt to show it. God's got to love you. You decided. <laughs> God loves you. But the idea, Kelly, that God loves me, sure, God loves my little boys. He loves, but love me. And it wasn't until, my wife can testify to this, it wasn't until the, the, the light bulb went off that it, he actually loves me. And it took time. And my wife would confess that the reason that our relationship is a lot better and that she, I love her better is because I received the love of God for my own personal life. I'm trying to tell you, if you want to love your neighbor, you got to love yourself. But in order to love yourself, you got to see God as God sees you. He loves you. Amen? And so the religious giver, or expert of the law, 
he uh, wants to justify himself and ask, who's the neighbor? Now, in my case, I told you this guy that I was dealing with, Bob, is my next door neighbor. But let's identify who the neighbor is. Now, before we do this, I want to ask you, and I wanted to say as a show of hands do this, but let your heart open up to this. How many people in this room would say, I want my priority to be God, God in my life. I, I really want it to be God. I want at the top tier of my life and my affections and my desire to be God over everything. If that is you this morning, God is saying to you and he's saying to me, yeah, love me with all your heart, soul, and mind, but you also to love me is to love others. To love me is to love your neighbor. And, and, and your neighbor might not be your preference. And this is where if Matt still do the he still do that buckle up? He still do that? This is where the buckle up part comes in. Where you got to put on the big boy pants or big girl pants. I don't like the idea of big girl pants. That just, my wife says, I hate when you say big girl pants. <laughs> don't say that no more. Loving your neighbor as yourself. And then here this guy says, wait a minute. Well, who's my neighbor then? And Jesus, I'm sure Jesus said, I... I'm so glad you asked. In St. Mary's County, I'm so glad that you asked because I'm going to show you who your neighbor is. By the way, I'm going to show you that loving your neighbor requires me to be involved. If I love you perfectly, there is something with inside of you in this room that can allow you to love other people who are not like you. Let's read. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down, and so this is a story that Jesus gave. A man was going down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho. When he saw he was attacked by robbers, go, they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest walked by. Here's a religious guy, happened to be going by down the road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So a Levite, when he saw, came by, and here's a lay person. This would be, if you're a volunteer a person here at South Point Church, the first one was a priest, it'd be like a pastor. Here's a lay person, another person who's religious. When he came by the place, he saw him, and he passed by on the other side. He said, man, I'm, just, I, I'm not going to get involved with this. But the Samaritan, real quick, just so you know, Samaritans, and you probably know this already, Samaritans hated Jews, and Jews hated Samaritans. Do we have any parallels like that today? Oh, no, no. We have no examples around here. Can, can I make it plain? Somebody said, make it plain. But the Samaritan, who wasn't like Jesus, wasn't like this guy, uh, the Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Here's what I'm going to ask you real quick. Where's your heart as it relates, as it relates to people who aren't like you? Because the proof of the love that is inside of you is based on your capacity, heart capacity, to wrap around people who aren't like you. And it's not an easy call. For some people, it requires Jesus Christ to get fully involved. When it came to Bob, it required Jesus Christ to be fully involved. And the Bob likes. And so he bandaged his wounds and he poured oil and wine on him. He, he, then he, he put the man on his donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Uh, then the next day he took two denarii money. Let me just explain real quick. He took two weeks of wages, at least, that would put this man up in an inn for at least two months. In other words, his love required him 
to spend some money. A little bit too hard, ain't it? Even me, I'm like, hey, wait a minute, hold on. You asking for my money? I got to, come on now. The next day, he looked after him and he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Go. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, well, here's what you do, and here's what we do in this room. We go and do likewise. Above our political persuasion, above our ethnic ideologies, above everything, the question this morning is what's your priority? Is it loving God and loving your neighbor or is it holding on to yourself? There's three things that I believe that God has revealed into this that, that we need to see. First of all, I'm going to ask the question, how do you view your neighbors? This will come up. How do you view your neighbors? The, uh, to love your neighbor requires a God view. Go to, go to this quote. It says, when you see as God sees, you have the ability to do as God would have you do. But it first starts with you being able to see it differently. No, and this is the reason why I love, hey, by the way, this could be tough for some people in this room, but I love this. I believe God is just, he did something in my life that the bobs of the world are people that I run to now, where at first I would avoid it. Let me just tell you this. The first day that we were here at Landmark Church, you just need to know this. When Matt Hall said to me, he said, I want you to come down here, and I want you to be a part of what we're doing. And he says, I just want to let you know that the demographics is not what it is right now, by the way. It has really, it's different. <laughs> it's different, Miss Kelly and Stephon, Aaron. <laughs> It's different. And he said, you might be misunderstood down there. He said, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to be misunderstood, Elwood Jones? I said, well, let's see. First day, back in the hallway over here, these people come, uh, I can't remember who, who it was right now. They might be in the room right now. Came and they rushed and said, Elwood, come here, come here, come here. And I, so I came and he said, hey, man, look, look, calm down. I'm like, calm down? <laughs> You're the one that's excited, not me. Calm down, calm down. Okay, something happened. I said, what happened? Well, someone called your son a name. This is my son, Kalen, who's 22 years old now. He was a little boy then. I said, what did he say? And, and he, couldn't, he couldn't even bring it out of his mouth. And I'll never forget my response. Here was my response, which probably wasn't the most appropriate response. I laughed. <laughs> I laughed. Not that that's funny, but what it is is an indicator that I'm going to see this as God see it, and I'm going to have the heart of this as God would have the heart of it. Being despised on the cross, being hated, being spit on, being shouted at, cussed at, Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they've done. The question is, what's our priority? Next, real quick, we're going to close this. Next, to love your neighbor requires that you have a God heart. Go to the next piece right here. When he, Jesus, saw the crowd, he was moved with compassion on them. Lastly, here's what I'm going to ask you. With knowing that now God has given you the ability to see this thing differently, because the only way you can respond differently, one, is that you have to see it differently. And as you see it differently, it also has the ability to change how you think about it. How you change about how you think about it also happens to move into your heart and how you feel about it. So I didn't hate on the person that called my son the N-word, I actually had compassion for them because they knew not what they did. But you can only do that 
if Jesus has given you a different picture, you don't completely dismiss the behavior, but you dismiss your ability to enter the behavior in a negative way. Does that make sense in here? Oh, can I get an amen on that one? So now the question is, how do I put feet to this? And Jesus says that, thank you because when I was hungry, you fed me. Remember this? Uh, thank you uh, when I was in prison, you visited me. Hospital, the whole night, he goes through the whole thing. And they said, when did you do that? Jesus, when did we do that for you? He's, the master says, you did this to me when you did it to the least of. If you really want to get down with God for real, for real, this is the stuff you do. You don't stand in the corner on other stuff that doesn't matter. You really get in the game with loving God and loving your neighbor. Bob, back to Bob, Budweiser Bob. <laughs> So I got to see Bob every day after that. And I couldn't say it was easy because my feelings were hurt. But I knew that my priority is Jesus, loving God and loving people, loving my neighbor. After entering some relationship issues with Bob, Bob starts opening up about his story. And now... The empathy starts to, the compassion starts to move because he's the way he is because of the conditioning that he's been around and brought up on. Bob looks at me and, and saw that we don't have our, tra our, our, our car to pull the trail anymore. Bob, who is guarded, who, who's always protective, says, hey, Elwood, I want you to use my truck anytime you want. I said, Bob, I can't do that. He says, no, use it anytime you want. Here's the key. Take the key. Take, take, take the key. By the way, Elwood, I want you to know I love what I see you doing with those kids. By the way, Elwood, sorry for how I've acted. I've let it get the best of me. He brings his family to church, first time, and on the day in which he came abruptly to our church, because we've never pushed him to come, we just told him what we had, said, one day I'm going to come. He comes to church, and God says, I want you to pray for people in the church today. This is, so I pray for people. Well, well, I'm standing up there, and my friend Bob raises his hand. How many of y'all, I said, how many want me to, to just pray for you? My friend Bob, who thinks maybe there might be a God, says, pray for my family. And I go to pray for his family, and Bob, after the service, is so choked up that he can't even speak. He's crying. And what I want to tell you, that those kind of stories don't happen if you don't allow the priority of God, loving God, and loving your neighbor to be in your life. As we close on the word of prayer, I'm going to ask you right now to think of one thing that you can do that will stretch you a little bit out of the box to reach your neighbor. And for some of us in this room, don't take the hardest person, right? Like, I'm going to go after the hard one. No, don't do that. But there's someone that needs your touch. There's someone who needs the imprint of God that's been on your life and in your heart to now be pressed against theirs. And God wants to use you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that with all that's been said, Lord, may you simplify this by first of all calling us to what is priority in our life. 
Many of us have competing priorities. And if I could be honest, there are times when I've let stuff compete with my priority for you. And so now, may you take preeminence in my life, top priority. May you be the top billing in my heart, soul, and mind, in our heart, soul, and mind, and let us from that reach out to our neighbors in a way that's effective. Help us do what we cannot do within ourselves, Lord. But for everybody in this room, I want you to tell them, speak specifically to them, to the one thing that we need to do. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.